All right. Good afternoon. I'm Christy Bell. I'm Associate Vice Provost and Executive Director of the UAA Business Enterprise Institute, and it's my privilege to be here yet again as your MC for the UA APU Business Plan Competition. This event has been going on since 1999, and I want to recognize a few folks in the audience who have just been tremendous supporters and integral to making this event happen. First and foremost, I want to recognize our CEO, or Chief, Chief Encouragement Officer, Alan Johnston. If you'd stand up, please. This event is really the vision of Alan and, and his team, the Entrepreneur and Mentors Network, as well as a, a whole host of folks. Um, but I would say Alan's been right in the center of that pack, encouraging everyone forward. So Alan's been tremendous in keeping this event going over the years. Then I also want to recognize some folks from each of the universities and um, the key faculty that are, are involved. Um, Kai Holland in the back here. Alaska Pacific. Kai's with Alaska Pacific University. Clearly, we, we um, run this event across all the, the universities here in Alaska. And Kai's been one of the key, he has been the key uh, lead for this year. We rotated th that around, and Kai's just been tremendous. I don't know what we would have done without Kai this year, so thank you, Kai. Next, I want to recognize Force Neighbors with University of Alaska Anchorage. Um, as well as Al Herman. Many of you know that Al had to, um, he had uh, surgery recently, so we're um, all praying for his quick recovery, and it sounds like he's doing wonderful, but he won't be here with us today, even though he's worked hard to get us to this event. Then I want to recognize um, UAF representative uh, Scott Bell. Um, we typically have um, faculty as well as um, folks from within the community that represent each institute. Scott um, is chair of the Nanook Innovation. That holds equity in companies coming out of UAF with UAF IP. Thank you for clarifying that. So, um, Scott Key um, from the UAF side, as well as Ping Lang, who's not here, is faculty from the UAF side. I also want to rec uh, recognize Dr. Rajmi Prasad. He's dean of the UAA College of Business and Public Policy. <laughs> Dr. Prasad's been a huge supporter of entrepreneurship on the UAA side, and these are um, clearly UAA facilities. So thank you, Dr. Prasad, for allowing us to host this event here today. All right, and I also want to recognize some of the vision behind um, these faculty and folks that I just introduced. Um, and hopefully I catch me if I forgot someone. Um, one of the key things that we've been working on across all of the universities to strengthen the entrepreneurial ecosystem across Alaska is to better collaborate and better have a, um, a chain of uh, activities that all culminate together and help businesses thrive across Alaska. So that starts with the Arctic Innovation Competition hosted on the UAF campus, led by Ping Lang, and that's really an idea competition. Then um, Kai Holland has been leading um, a, a series of startup weekends really to help businesses test their models and figure out how they can be best improved. Then um, we have a, a planning phase Clearly today is the culmination of the business plan work that's been happening, but we also have um, a series of uh, speakers that come and speak on entrepreneurship throughout the year. We also have a, a series of entrepreneurship boot camp and other activities that help those business plans come to this point today the strongest they can be. And then we have, we partner with folks like the uh, Anchorage Economic Development Corporation, who's leading Entrepreneurship Week, 
and um, uh, helps really bring that financing and launch piece together. So folks across the state working together very collaboratively to strengthen the entrepreneurial ecosystem across Alaska. Today what you're going to have is the top five business plans. We were able to vet 10 to the final round and then the top five of those are what you will see today. We had folks uh, submitting from Washington State to Spain to um, clearly all across Alaska. So the business plan competition is really getting wide recognition. A Little bit about the rules. Each uh, individual will have 15 minutes total, or each team will have 15 minutes total. Of that, 10 minutes will be used for their presentation. That's the total max time, so if you see us cutting people off, that's because we're trying to keep it fair for everyone participating. And then our judges will have five minutes for questions and, and answers from the, those that are competing. If there's any additional time, then we may open it up to the audience, but we always let our judges have that five minutes for Q&A. And if you judges need a few more minutes, just let me know and we'll lag it just a short time. We'll have an intermission where our judges will um, reconvene outside and figure out um, who their top awardees are. And during that time, we're gonna hear from uh, Jason Smith, one of our former winners of this competition, as well as um, we'll have a people's choice voting and there'll be some food. So uh, we hope that you stay through the entire event. So I wanna take a moment now and recognize our judges. And I have Terry Shutterleff, Shirtleff. Thank you, Terry. Terry is the new president of the Alaska Industrial Hardware, following 10 years as a CFO. Prior to joining Alaska Industrial Hardware, he worked um, in the industrial equipment brokering, appraisal, and finance. And thank you, Terry, for being here today. We had, have Fred Stutzer. And Fred is a born and raised Alaskan. He has a CPA providing audit services throughout Alaska and uh, pr provides support, CFO, or, uh, CPA support to a variety of industries. After directing the financial services department of a local nonprofit organization, he started a sole proprietorship, which has since evolved into managing a portfolio of residential investment properties. More recently, as a founding member of the 49th State Angel Investor Network and as a member of the Alaska Ex Accelerator Fund, Fred intends to promote individual entrepreneurs of early stage companies through mentorship and by providing access to financial support. Thank you, Fred, for being here. Alex Worthen. Alex is a certified validation analysis and investor working in real estate, international microloans, technology development, and, a member, and is a member of the Alaska Accelerator Fund. Thanks, Alex. Ryan Edwards. Ryan is currently vice president with First National Bank Alaska, where he specializes in corporate lending. He has over 13 years of experience in the financial services industry, most of which has been spent in private banking and in wealth management. Ryan has also been the winner of multiple entrepreneurship competitions over the years, including second first place finishes in national competitions. Thanks, Ryan, for being here. Eric McCollum. Eric is founder and president of Arctic Wire Rope and Supply in Alaska. In 2006, they were awarded the Alaska Manufacturer of the Year. Eric is a founding grantor and board director of MCE Social Capital an innovate microcredit lender that has loaned over 100 million in 25 third world countries. He mentors and angel invests in startup companies within Alaska in clean technology nationally and social enterprise uh, businesses. Thank you, Eric, for being here. And we have Mike Martin. Mike is the executive vice president and general counsel and corporate secretary at Northrum Bank. Thanks, Mike, for being here. And Mike's one of those, one of our judges, a few of our judges are here year after year. So thank you for those that commit your time. John Bittner. 
John is a fifth generation Alaskan who currently serves as the Deputy Commissioner of the Alaska Department of Commerce, Community, and Economic Development, where he oversees the divisions of Economic Development, Banking, and Securities, and the Alcoholic Beverage Control Board. Full time job. He also serves on the boards of the Alaska Housing Finance Corporation and the Alaska Seafood Marketing Institute. Prior to joining state government, John served as vice president of the Anchorage Economic Development Corporation, where he created a variety of entrepreneur and innovation related events, including Alaska Entrepreneurship Week, the Alaska Hackathon, and the Anchorage Mini Maker Fair, the Alaska Makers Group, and the Crowdfunding Forum. Lots of work John's done in the, to support the entrepreneurial ecosystem here in Alaska. We have Scott Bell. Scott Bell is president of two early stage investing companies in Fairbanks, Nanook Tech Ventures and Veris Corporation. Nanook Tech Ventures is the for-profit company founded in 2013 by UAF to launch companies based on university intellectual property. As of April 2015, three companies have been formed using UAF IP, that's intellectual property, and Nanook Tech Ventures has a small equity stake in each of these. Veris is a small early stage investing company whose vision is investing in people making a difference. It invests primarily in technology and software companies with management teams, excellence of the key determinant getting investment. Scott has over 30 years of experience as a mechanical engineer with, a vari with various Alaska architecture and engineering firms and is currently UAF Associate Vice Chancellor for, for Facility Services. Thanks Scott for being here. We have Juanetta Ayers. Juanetta has worked for many years in public economic development roles, including economic development policy planning and implementation, business development, and workforce development. Juanetta has worked across the state and is one of those economic development practitioners that many of us look to. We have Barbara Amy. Barbara uh, Amy hails from the greater state of Connecticut and began her career in finance as securities fraud investigator for the National Association of Securities Dealers in New York City and later in the Washington, D.C. She returned to school full-time to earn her MBA from the University of Chicago. Since then, Barbara has spent 20 years pursuing a career in various aspects of corporate finance before moving to Alaska in 2002. Since 2002, she has, she has been employed as manager of corporate finance for Native, Native Corporation in Anchorage and as a business consultant. In March 2006, she joined the corporate finance team of the Alaska Railroad, and she is currently today the CFO for the Alaska Railroad. So thank you. Thank you all for being here as our judges, and I appreciate all of everyone giving them a <laughs> Sorry, and there wasn't a, a nice way for me to do it, so I, I apologize and appreciate everyone. All right, so I think that we've done all of our um, housekeeping here. Just uh, we're going to try and keep it very um, tight scheduled, and we're also going to um, try and have no distractions for the folks that are making presentations. If there is any type of emergency or event where we need to evacuate, there's doors on both the left and right and main exits out. There's restrooms right out. Go ahead and take care of what you need. And I think that we are ready to get going. Am I good? So our first, and I had all of that information, but I have little information on those that are presenting. First up is Alaska Paracrod Design. I'm sorry if I've butchered that. And it's Grayson, Grayson Davey. <laughs>
Hello, my name is Grayson Davey, and my business is Alaska Paracord Designs. I would like to thank everyone in the audience and every judge that has, had, uh, has given their time to be here today. We sell wearable and usable survival gear that we started selling in 2013 and we are in the survival products industry where we are under sole proprietorship and we are changing to an LLC or C corporation. Our management team includes the founder and CEO, me, Grace and Davey, and also Al Herman, who is the professor of entrepreneurship here at UAA, where he has been helping me learn the ins and outs of running a business. And also Trent Davey, who is an Alaska Airlines pilot, and he is former US Air Force and has extensive survival training, and he helps with the development and evolution of the products. Next is Lori Davey, who is the general manager of Fairweather and well, Fairweather LLC, and she what she does is helps with uh, uh, keeping my books steady and the marketing and sales of the products. Our first product is the Alaska Survival Bracelet, which contains 16 feet of paracord, a military grade fire steel, carbon steel scraper, eight inches of wax tender, and a whistle buckle. The paracord can be used to tie a shelter together. The fire steel, scraper, and tinder can be used to start a fire. And the whistle buckle, and that's blowing lightly, can signal for rescue. We came up with the bracelet idea when one of our dear friends went out on the Squintner River. And unfortunately, the motor stopped on his boat and the anchor didn't sink. So they caught a sweeper, the boat flipped, and they swam to the shore of an island. And they were there for three days without any food, water, or shelter. And when they got on the shore, all of their clothes were ripped off, pants, shoes, socks, everything. And lighter came out, everything. So when they were out there, they had nothing to survive. Luckily, one of our friends came down the river and saw them waving their arms because if he wasn't there, they would have died that night. And it's a serious situation when you get into a survival area where you need to survive. So that's why we made the, the Alaska Survival Bracelet. Our second product is the Firebug. The Firebug contains 10 feet of paracord, a military grade fire steel, the carbon steel scraper, and six inches of wax tender. On top of the bracelet, this also includes five, well, this also includes an X-Acto knife to cut anything that you might need, paracord, or even game if you get any. And it also has a mylar signal mirror that can signal for rescue, and it can also double, because you can see through it, as sunglasses for snow blindness. And this also contains five inches of duct tape that can be used for just about anything in a survival situation. And our third product is the Fish and Flame, which has everything that, if you can see here, everything that the, the firebug has, plus it has eight inches instead of five inches of tape, two hooks, two split shot, two Alaskan flies, two pieces of yarn, and 20 feet of spider wire fishing line. The fish and flame is basically a longer, fatter version of the firebug, and it, this has everything to start a fire, tie your shelter together, signal for rescue, and it has a built-in fishing kit. Our industry is the survival products industry, and it's $120 million a year, and the industry growth has been 5% per year, since 2005 to 2011. And our competitors include Bison Designs, Gerber Gear, and Wazoo. And these competitors, like Bison Designs, are made in China, so the quality is low and the price is low. And then other competitors like Wazoo have high pricing and high quality, 
but they have a lot of stuff in there that you don't really need, and it sort of weighs you down. So this Alaska Paracord Designs has found a healthy medium where we are in the middle of all the pricing, and we also have everything that you need to survive. Our target market includes anywhere from outdoors enthusiasts to weekend warriors, and also fishermen, fishermen and hunters, survivalists, and extreme sports enthusiasts. But women are our largest percentage of buyers, and users are mainly men. So, just saying. <laughs> I'm not being sexist. It's just that's what it tends to be. <laughs> and for our sales and marketing, we have made $40,000 to date since 2013, and we are made in Alaska certified. And our direct sales come from our website, alaskaparacord.com, and the Smirnard Market. Our retailers are B&J's Commercial in Anchorage and Diamond D Leather out in the valley. Here are compressed financials. And you might see that the gross margin is 57%, so we make a fairly good margin. And then you might also see that in 2016, our net income might be low. Be that's because that's when we are basically investing heavily and trying to market the product as much as possible. And then 2017 through 19, it all pays off and we keep growing from then on. And then our challenges include production, where we cannot keep up with the orders that are coming in and we want to have inventory so we can actually get orders out as they come in, not start making them right when they come in. And then our material costs, we are buying most of our materials at retail right now, and when we lower that to buy them at wholesale, that's going to increase our profit, and then we can start decreasing our costs so it's more affordable. And our distribution, we want to distri distribute in more local retailers, big box stores, and the lower 48. We are seeking $75,000 in funding, and 20,000 will go towards marketing, where we want to improve our website, and also we want to brand, basically brand the company. So we have little cardboard pieces to go on, say a bracelet, when someone buys them so they can see how it works. And also we want to invest in inventory so we have enough inventory to keep up with the orders that are coming in. And then working capital, where we're going to need to pay our employees and also hire a sales manager to, or a business manager, since I'm gonna be in school most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> and then also 5,000 of this will be contingency and will probably fall inside marketing inventory or working capital if we don't find an area that we didn't think about. Thank you for all being here today and I'm glad to take any questions. So um, it's real impressive, thank you for that presentation. Uh, how do you, who, who does the manufacturing for you, and how do you find people to do that? Well, right now I have three employees, and, <laughs> and I'm looking for more, because I still cannot keep up with the production, but basically I'm finding all employees within Alaska. I'm hoping to keep it that way, but if I run out of employees to find in Alaska, then I can move to a little 48 to find people. That was my question as well. <laughs> yeah. So with the previous sales that you've made, have you received any feedback from users? Um, you know, have, have, have users actually need to, needed to utilize your products in, in the field, um, many things, and, and have you made modifications to your design as a result of that? Yes, I've always been innovating this design, and correct frankly, right now we're coming up with a 2.0 bracelet that's soon to be out, and that has a new fire steel that is longer and stays on the bracelet a lot easier because some people have had the fire steel come off. 
And then we are also working on integrating a knife in the bracelet too. And that's all from consumer feedback. I mean, once you get your manufacturing down, are you are you going to be going to shows outside, like outdoor shows, to? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've gone. In, I've technically been in the Sportsman show. I well, Diamond D Leather, one of our retailers, they take our product and they go into the Sportsman show with it. So they sell a product there. They make a big order every year for that. And I just recently, I had a four thousand dollar order just from them. And they make those three or four times a year. So, well, how many units, uh, like say for example, of the bracelet are you able to produce now? So right now I have one employee that's making bracelets and two that are making firebugs. Okay. We're hoping, because now we have enough firebugs, we're hoping to switch one over to bracelets. And right now we can probably get in probably about 15 or 20 a week. Okay. And so with this, uh, infusion of capital, you expect to grow your production by? Yes, I am hoping. Yeah. I could sell these day and night. I, I still haven't reached down the lower 48 yet, and in Alaska, I still can't keep up with the demand. At some point, would it be possible to, I mean, I'm assuming it's possible to sort of automate the, the, the manufacturing, or is it, is it, do you need to make them by hand, I guess? Well, you need to make them by hand. Technically, anything can be done with a machine. You just have to put enough money into it. So, but this, there's a lot of handmade parts that need to go into it. You have to tie it the right tightness. It has to be this size. So, yeah, there's a lot of aspects that go on to making it. What does the investor get for the seventy-five thousand? Um, I'm willing to work that out privately right now. Now we can have a meeting. We can work that out. Is there a question or two from the audience? Uh, do you hold any trademarks or patents on? I do hold a trademark on Alaska Prayer Corps designs, but I do not hold any patents on them yet. Do you think it's a patent on the Uh Yes, I do. And I know that the bracelet might have some competition, but I think there's enough setting it apart in the 2.0 bracelet that is patentable. And then the firebug, there's almost nothing like it outside. The firebug and the fission flame are definitely patentable. When you release the bracelet, how are you going to train them? Well, I've trained them all by myself by myself, I just take about maybe one or two hours to train them, and I give them five products to make, uh, then I bring them back, see what the quality is, and if I have to retrain them, I retrain them a little bit, and then they get it from there. We have just a quick change over here, and then we have Bambino's Baby Food LLC, and it's Zoe Marudis. Sorry, Zoe. Zoe Marudis. Hello and good afternoon. Welcome to Bambinos. So a little bit about me. Um, my folks have a restaurant here in town, so I kind of started my restaurant experience many years before university and uh, with Greek and Italian establishment. And then I started, went off to study medicine in, down in Texas, so I've combined my medical background with Greek and Italian experience and restaurant tour to create Bambinos Baby Food. 
Here's our trademark. This is the locations we currently are. Here in town, we have New Sagaya's Midtown, Pizza Olympia, Big John's gas stations down in the Seward Kenai area. And a little bit of important information is Alaska is facing a lot of obesity issues here in the state of Alaska. We have many children who have to kind of uh, deal with their parents with wanting to eat the salty, sweet McDonald's, fried food, fast food. And we try to create a company that is, tastes delicious, that is delicious, and very nutritious for you so we can compete with what is currently out in the market. Not only that, but baby food itself is not very delicious. So you, by making it taste delicious, you're going to help create a healthy lifestyle for a child thereafter. This is a product comparison of our baby food. This is one of Gerber's uh, products. And in our products, we do protein, carbohydrates, and vegetables all in one, where typically you would see peas in a jar or carrots in a jar. What we'd like to do is combine all the protein, carbohydrates, and vegetables in every bite. So this is the product comparison for something similar that Gerber has out there, which is shelf-stable. Ours is a frozen product. And um, as you can see, we do quite well. It's because we're able to keep the product frozen that we're able to control the nutrition value by not having to heat it up at very high boiling points, as you would in shelf-stable products. And this is one of our products, the vegetables with chicken. And this is what our actually products looks like inside the pouch. They come in a stand-up Ziploc pouch. The parents are able to remove the desired amount to qualify for each, each child's nutrition uh, value that they need. Some parents might remove two cubes. Some parents might remove three or four. So most of our pouches are on average three to four meals, depending on the child's eating uh, habits. And this is our sweet spring, excuse me, sweet spring veggies. And as you can see, we are also organic, organic and kosher. So our typical products that you'll see is celery, carrots, yellows, yams, leeks. We do also gluten-free. And these are all types of ingredients that children do not show allergies to them. So you could be able to introduce it to a child at the very early on without having onstruck uh, allergy restrictions or things like that. Um, another thing that would be important is, of course, you would still kind of make sure that you give them a little bit, test it out, and then continue to feed them in the next day. We have a breakfast cereal, a filet mignon vegetable stew. That sounds kind of interesting that you say, why would I put filet mignon? It has the highest source of iron in the most compact form, and it's also very tender. And then we have our teething cookies no sugars, everything. And something unique about our product, right now we just developed a peanut teething cookie that has been tested here in the Anchorage Allergy and Immunology Clinic. Um, the last, uh, excuse me, the New England Journal of Medicine just passed a new information that if a child is given peanuts at a specific amount each day by the ages of four months plus, they're able to reduce the, the, reduce the amount of allergies in peanuts in children. So we are the first on the market, and we've been tested also in California, that uh, we're able to, it's almost like a prescription that tastes good, mm -hmm. that a child will be able to have every day one cookie a day for the next six to a year month, excuse me, six months to a year, that will help them reduce those peanut allergies. So when you go to the store, you'll see over here on the right is the five jars, or you can see them in the squeeze pouches. They're the same product, yeah, some of them have changed with making it a little bit more fancy, uh, like um, pomegranate and kiwi or something more interactive, things like that. But at the same idea, you're still having bland, sterile food that has been heated up at a very high boiling point. With our products, it's very nutritious, it's healthy, it tastes good. This is according to the census from 2010. We're able to hit all of the main points of what people, the consumers are looking for. We are organic, we're kosher, we have no additives or preservatives, we're very easy to use, very comfortable in the freezer where you can, no space is taken. We also have a very small carbon footprint for those who are interested in that as well because we just do the stand-up pouches where you can put so many products all in one bag. 
were convenient, vitamins, no fortified vitamins, all natural. According to the United States, we have $55 billion in sales each year for baby food. That's only from two-thirds of the market. Our market, the leading competitors, would be Gerber. Gerber at 70%. They haven't changed much through all these years. They've kind of stayed consistent with how they've been from the 1960s. Beechnut was one of their competitors and also one of their innovators that made Gerber change from removing salts and sugars and additives from their products. Earth's Best, and then we have the new leading product, which is Plum. Plum baby food is the ones that you see now in the s stores with the little squeeze pouches. Unfortunately, yes, they're still uh, shelf stable, and, but the other thing that's unfortunate is that parents are supposed to serve the product in a spoon and feed their child. Typically, though, you see the parents just give it and squeeze through their pouches. That also causes malformation of the muscles in the mouth of the child because they're supposed to be able to learn how to chew and eat properly. Now, the rest of the one-third of the market is moms and parents who want to make their baby food at home. Parents today are 50, 50 times more busy than they have ever been. They're very interactive with making their children's nutrition because they simply cannot find what is out in the market. We're looking for an investment of $1.2 million for our equipment. Our equipment is roughly around $600,000 for operations, marketing, and a little bit for contingency. This is our executive summary. Our executive summary also shows here an increase from every year to have an inventory of 60,000, the year two would be 120, year three would be 180, and so forth. We have excellent margins, and it's very important when you're talking about children's nutrition that we're, Bambino's baby food has the specific target that can address the two-thirds of the market and the one-third market that is currently out there. We can be able to bring in the parents who want to cook things at home and the ones who want to buy the products already ready. Our products right now, they're uh, frozen, they're convenient, they're friendly. It's very attractive and also very attractive to investors. With the community, you would be able to do well for the community and also profit well from them as well. Something interesting and very exciting is that Plum was founded in 2006 and it was by a family at home for the same reason they were trying to find something good out there for their children, they weren't finding it, and they created it. Six years later, it was bought for 250 million nearly by Campbell Soup. These are great numbers, and yet again, we are very unique from them, so we have the opportunity to get into the market and create and captivate our customers and our families. Uh, with what we're looking at right now, with an 11x return, we can go back to our executive summary is that parents here, or Alaskan families, we have a roughly here in Anchorage 7,000 babies born just at Providence Hospital and at Alaska Regional. Uh, through the states, we have nearly, I uh, believe, almost 20,000 babies. So within the state of Alaska, we would be able to target and sell nearly 100,000 baby food products here in the state of Alaska alone, not including what we intend on doing with online uh, shipping and um, with our frozen fulfillment center in Kansas. We I have a minute left. Would you, any questions? And I can take that minute and ask her more questions if you have. Yeah. Well, thanks. Very impressive to see such a high quality, um, high quality baby food and uh, the, the way you're freezing it, so you don't have to process it at high temperature. It makes a lot of sense. Uh, you know, I see. It, uh, it was when I read read the uh, the, the write up that came out to the judges. Uh, um, you need to start thinking about the you know the market and how much food being produced, how much produce and stuff is being produced in Alaska, and whether that could keep up with uh, uh, your growth curve there. And so, thoughts on how you would manage growth of this if it does take off? Well, with the equipment that we have on hand right now, we would be able to keep these same projections and make these revenues with the equipment that we have on hand now, that or the ones that we're looking at with a $600,000 investment. 
So all you would basically need is you can, by the, get those type of numbers, you can just add one more extra reserve in case one of your equipment malfunctions. How about getting enough vegetables and stuff, Alaska grown? Uh, we do produce. intend on doing Alaska grown. We've also actually talked about with a gentleman that does Alaska organics that uh, potentially that when they start doing their root growing vegetables, we can also do with them. As now, uh, granted, in the wintertime, it may be a little bit more challenging to be able to do the fresh products, but at the same time, we have the privilege that we're a frozen company, so we can kind of direct that accordingly. So you see, it'll probably be a seasonal, have a seasonal um, makeup to the manufacturing just because of the flow of fresh produce. Yes, and you can otherwise we would have to outsource. Is your distribution model going to be through retailers or direct? There's going to be two. We're doing online subscription and retailers. Retailers for the state of Alaska specifically, while we're trying to get connected. And, uh, have you <coughs> had any success with retailers in terms of the way they go to market now with that particular product group? Yes, we have success. There's only one catch. The catch is the equipment. Right now we're manufacturing out of Pizza Olympia during their off hours which limits my time and only certain amounts of pots and pans that are available to do that. So mo most of the manufacturers, excuse me, the retail stores are looking someone that can produce the sufficient amount and that would be with the equipment. What about the freezer, I mean it's been a while since I've been in the baby aisle but I don't remember any freezer cases there so are, are you convincing them to put in freezer cases? Yes, we are, that's the other idea is that we would like to have a freezer. I have tested it in New Sagaya where I've had it in the freezer aisle. Unfortunately, many times it's next to the pastries or next to something else like that, and it's very, um, it's very hard to direct your customers there, even with the flyer saying in the baby food aisle, go to the frozen aisle. <laughs> yes? So every uh, good business needs a good idea, uh, needs somebody who understands business. Clearly, that's something that you have. Uh, but the third uh, thing that you need is cash. So you're asking for a million and a half how much of your own uh, dollars are you putting into it, or what's your initial capital position? Right now, on my own, I have invested nearly 60000 um, Not only that, I have, when we sit there and we calculated the budget, I didn't give myself um, a salary for the next how many couple of years that would be needed. I put it back into the company. And this number is what I would feel comfortable with the startup of the company, giving it that momentum that it needs to get on the market. Now, granted, the equipment, we can easily go out to the market, to a bank, and try to convince them with my background and say, you show my financials, say, let's go for that investment. But it's really the marketing and that you would need that extra 600000 to give it that potential push. Because without the marketing, you can make as much baby food as you want. But <laughs> so if you're not, not going to ask for a loan, then uh, how much of the company are you giving up for a million and a half? We can definitely discuss that later. <laughs> So your market's outside, your your products are outside. Why are you, I, I mean, why, why, come, why are you doing up here? I'm so glad you asked that question. Well, Alaska is really known for its energy production. It's time for it to be put on the map for something different as well. <laughs> okay. the, the other addition to that would be, um, we have unique and beautiful water. I lived in Texas. Uh, Texas has the grossest water you can imagine. <laughs> you open up the water and tss, <laughs> that's water. That's not carbonated water we're talking about. So just to follow on, Plum mm -hmm. sold for 250 So where were they located? They were located in California. Next to where? There's no water. <laughs> <laughs> True. <laughs> Just a follow up on, on Terry's question about your distribution. Um, I mean, what experience do you have in, in uh, supply chain management with a frozen food product? Um, there seems like there's a lot of complications. Um, I, I guess what I like, and if you'll excuse the comparison, um, I sort of liken this to the product Fresh Pet, which, if you go and look at the retail outlets, um, Fresh Pet has obviously put the chill, the freezer unit or the chiller unit in the stores. Yes. So I, I don't see that reflected in your plan. 
And I, I'm just wondering then, um, how do you manage uh, with the online sales with maintaining the frozen product, the quality of it, and how do you deal with um, the likelihood of spoilage in route? And now I'm trying to try to remember all the different avenues of your question. Um, one with inside here, we've kind of done the marketing as if if it's in a fulfillment center. Granted, in there we have costs for shipping, for packaging, for the distribution, for the travel time, all of that. With that, you can also sit there and say, well, if we're going to do a retail store, that same amount, whether it's going to be cost of putting the product on the shelf or also putting the mini freezers, which you've already calculated for right now for the state of Alaska, that we would need probably around 23 little mini freezers, which are very inexpensive, around $650 that you would be able to put a brand in there and keep it like that. Granted, any product, anything like that, has the process potential of spoilage. So you would also have to calculate that. But it's not so significant that you would worry about it because in today's world, everything is from caviar to seafood to anything like that is shipped all around the world. Now, with our frozen fulfillment center that we're looking at from through Kansas, I w just was informed today that they're also planning on pr bringing one into the Washington area, which would be wonderful for us because we'll be able to target both East Coast and West Coast. Because I'm thinking, as at the beginning, as for a marketing approach, that the w the West Coast, where is Seattle, excuse me, Washington, California, Oregon, would be an ideal place to target your product. Did did I answer all of them? Thank you. Uh, out of time, do you have more questions as real, judges? Real quick. Okay. I just, can you talk about when you get to year six, best case scenario, how many people you anticipate having employing? And also, is this, are you so far, are you the only person on the team or is there, are there other people involved at this stage? We do have board, advi a board of advisors and we are looking for the top experienced people, specifically in marketing. Um, now, um, Sorry, what was the first question? Number of employees. At Number of employees. Year six when you hit your stride. Now, at the beginning of first year, you see we have a leftover of 380. I also intend on putting uh, more of a um, what do you call it uh, a, su a supply line or what do you call it conveyor line mm -hmm. system in there to be able to package and seal. When we're talking about here in year six, we're at 500,000 units per month being made. The equipment that we have is pretty much self-contained that is able to run with not really having too many employees. So probably I can't really guess to the best of my knowledge would probably be an increase of maybe 10 at best case scenario kind of thing like that. Because most of our equipment, for example, the uh, emulsifier chops, cuts, cooks, does everything and then we just need someone to pour it out and put it in our little forms. and put it in our package and in our freezer. And then we also have the cookies, the same thing. It mixes it, it cuts it, it shapes it. Then we have to put someone to put it in the oven to cook it and take it out and do the packaging. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from the judges? Thank you so very much. All right, next we have Harbinger LLC and Mike Jedlicka, as well as Dr. George Jedlicka. Yep. Hey guys, thanks everybody for coming today. I hope you get a lot of value from my presentation. Um, so, a quick question. How many of you have booked a ticket, like an airline ticket online? With a uh, good show of hands. Okay, so it worked out pretty well. You use that continually. So, what Harbinger is setting forth to do is to create a better booking service and a better travel experience for guides and clients alike in the recreation realm of things. So, uh, who we are? Mike and, uh, my, that's myself, and my brother. He's not here, so, I know the founders aren't going to like this, but we literally heard about you guys two weeks ago when we went to One Million Cups. So we decided to submit our information, and luckily we were getting accepted, so thank you for that. Um, so we're from Nactic, Alaska. We're recreation enthusiasts. We love going outside and fishing. Um, as of now, there's no unified place to go book a recreation-based activity in Alaska. 
So think of the last time you tried to book a fishing charter and how frustrating it was, right? You either know, you know through word of mouth or going online and you find a, a terrible website and you can only call at this time and you have to talk to so-and-so. If you call outside of that time, you're going to talk to the mother-in-law, the sister-in-law, you're going to leave a voicemail, no one's going to pick up. So moving on, what does Harbinger do? So Harbinger aligns customers with a quick, quality, recreation-based tourism in such a manner that will make for an exceptional trip. Um, it's starting in Alaska. We're starting with fishing. We plan to make it ubiquitous through it, Alaska. There's plenty of money to be made in Alaska. Once we get that solid, we will move to different states and make it a multinational corporation and go uh, overseas as well. So starting off, we're starting off with fishing first, and then later on we will go on to um, whatever activities will garner us the highest ROI. So um, these are the examples of the different state territories that we'd like to hit. Basically anything that has a, hard, a high um, tourism industry. Basically, if you have a seat, we'll book it for you. Um, competition. So we don't have competition. We have similar com companies to us. They have the Alaska app, which is more of informative and easy to use, but it doesn't really do anything. REI is very expensive and they have limited bookings. Adventures.com is informative. There's a few bookings. They're very exotic and boutique, and you won't find that they're very affordable. But Harbinger accomplishes everything. It, it rewards the guides. It rewards the clients. It includes fishing. It's in Alaska. And as you can see, the price range is uh, very versatile to everyone's budget. So what's in it for the guides? Why do they even want to do this? Well, this will allow the guide to market their business in an effective way, allowing for a streamlined industry. Um, they'll also be able to manage their booking. So a good example is my friend Wally. He's a helmet guide and charter down in Nilchik. So he has a boat that holds six people. And when he has a boat of six people, they, are all, they all have halibuts on at the same time. And he answers his phone when somebody calls to make a booking for the next trip. So right now, Wally will be able to change. He'll be able to go home at the end of the day, look at his phone, already see that all his bookings have been confirmed. And he was able to unhook these fish and rebate uh, without even messing around. So um, businesses that aren't doing very well, they can use Har uh, Harbinger Consulting Services to help them do better. Um, what's in it for the clients? So um, this will create a tool that allows the clients to book your ticket just like you did online. Very easy, very streamlined, very efficient, very fast. Um, also, to keep our clients loyal, just like Alaska Airlines does with their beautiful points, um, it becomes addicting. You, you create points with Harbinger by using uh, the service for future trips. So deployment, we have a prototype done. I will show that to you in a little bit. Um, we need to get initial owners involved. So right now, we have multiple guides who are ready to unleash on Harbinger with their tickets, their prices, and their availability. Uh, we plan on going to trade shows and getting press releases from different um, literature and publications. So our marketing plan, we're either going to use MSI or Spawn Ideas here in Anchorage to take care of us. Um, we have a list of all the recreation companies in Alaska that we will carpet bomb with our communication. Um, our logo, we crowdsourced. Um, social media, we're on there. Um, and this is kind of a cool thing. So the developer of our website um, actually has a, a contract with ADF&G. Um, and this will be great for the client. They'll be able to buy their uh, fishing license from our site, as well as their ticket. And for the guides, they'll also be able to log their kill counts of the fish, which is going to become a rule in 2016. So a lot of value for the guides. So, Anyone who's um, in the travel industry, we want to get Harbinger advertisements in front of them. These are high profile demographic markets. So um, how does Harbinger make money? So Harbinger makes money from commissions from these seats that we book. Um, income from interest. So if a, uh, if a seat is booked in January, um, the guy doesn't get paid till June. So we will earn interest on that money that's held. And uh, consulting services that we will offer to businesses who would like to use, utilize us for that and any advertisements where we deem necessary. Um, so let's talk about crunching numbers. So 2015, all depends on timing. Um, who gives us money first? We will start in 2015 if that's the case. Right now with this conservative graph, we are starting January 1st, 2016. Uh, we hope to get in our foothold in the Alaska market. Um, no competition exists like this, um, or no, no company exists like this. So these numbers are conservative. Um, but we hope to get our foothold in 2016. Um, 20, 2017, we hope to be ubiquitous in the Alaska market. And then at that point, we will expand to other states and other territories and also incorporate other activities in years 2018 year 2019, too. Uh, we have healthy margins at 20%, very low overhead. So next stage, what do we need money for? So we have to finish the final website. Right now, my brother and I have invested $10,000 um, of our own money into the initial prototype. 
Um, we need a website and an app. Uh, the website and the app is going to cost us about $100,000. Um, there's a lot of spinning gears in the back part of the website that, that adds to the cost. You know, $100,000 for a website is kind of a lot. Um, it's got to be able to incorporate transactions, dates, calendars, um, prices, availability. So stats, 2 million visitors to Alaska, 50% by cruise, 50% come by air. Um, they spend $2 billion annually. One out of every three is a repeat customer. And there's 462,000 fishing licenses sold a year. So let's crunch a little pro forma statements. So we have 3,000 guide licenses sold per year. Assume 90 guide working days with four seats sold per day at an average cost of $200 each. We generate revenue of $216 million in the state. Assume Harbinger's market share is 10%. We're going for 10%. We'll be conservative here. That's a, a market share of $21.6 million um, with our overhead of 15%. Um, we have uh, 4.43 in profits. So with our $200,000 that we are seeking, um, the first hundred and twenty dollars will be used for marketing and to finish the website and the app. The other $80,000 will be for um, operation capital, uh, contingency, and paying our CEO. Um, and any other expenses that we incur. So my brother, uh, we knew about this two, two, month, uh, two weeks ago. Uh, he's in New York learning how to place dental implants right now. He's a dentist down in Soldatna. He'd love to be here. He's here in spirit, um, but you know, <coughs> short notice. So summary, Harbinger aligns customers with quality recreation, tourism in such a manner that will make for an exceptional trip. We are seeking 200K in capital to advance Harbinger to a cash flowing business. Um, and our goal is to create a better booking service and better travel experience for guides and clients alike. So let's see this puppy. Hopefully this works. UA needs faster internet. <laughs> okay, all right, so here we go. This is Harbinger's website. Um, you go on here, you wanna go fish for silvers down in the Kenai Peninsula, and you wanna take your buddy with you. Click this link, come to my website, click this link. You can get more information, I'll email you uh, when this thing goes live. So I got two minutes, all right. So we're gonna hit search. Um, it'll populate with all the guides that are available. And I really like this guy because he looks slightly crazed and he's got great reviews, Carl. Um, so I go to Carl's page. I see it costs $325 per seat. I can see his trip details, my itinerary, what's provided, what I need. Um, it'll give me directions and of course, uh, there's a map here, but this internet's so slow, it's not loading the map. Um, and uh, it shows where he is on the Nilchik. So, great. We can go to book it. Cool. It'll, we'll enter in our car number here on PayPal. There's our merchant account. Confirm and pay. And we'll go share it with all our friends on social media. Um, now, for the guide, the guide will be able to log into his page. And it'll see all of his financials, how much money he's made for the year. Um, he'll be able to add bookings, change anything he needs to do, kind of like Facebook does. Um, and he will have his, his information available right here for him. So, well, without further ado, I'll start accepting questions this time. Everyone, a simple one to start with. Uh oh, explain, what's the danger? Explain the name Harbinger. So Harbinger, look up in the dictionary. Harbinger means it is somebody who goes out in front of, it's a military word, it means somebody who goes out in front of the troops to locate accommodations or lodgings. So the name's apt for what we're trying to do. It, it's just to, play devil's advocate, it, it's a word that has other meaning uh, besides that, and, and I, which I associate with something negative. So I would suggest that maybe you research that name and think about what maybe some of those connotations might be. Sure. So um, as far as the competition, I know there's no online booking portal, but you know, for something like Alaska, which is a pretty captive audience and has you know, two thirds of people here coming as part of a tour. Aren't you competing with, uh, you know, cruise line concierge, um, you know, whoever the booking agency was, the tour guide who's taken them throughout the state? You know, a lot of those sales are already made as part of that package. So, is that competition in your mind? Sort of. Um, so, going back to the, the the number crunching part, I mean, we know we can't get everybody. We know that those you know big companies like Princess and Royal Caribbean they're gonna have they're gonna have packages already pre-made you know that's not who we go for I mean think of any fishing trips you've gone was it with Princess probably not um, I'm Alaskan you are an Alaskan however I mean this is gonna be something easily uh, available I mean if you go to you know Princess they're not gonna sell you a two hundred dollar halibut charter they're gonna sell you a halibut charter they're gonna sell you a you know three or four nights stay on a cruise boat they're gonna sell you a big ticket item 
I mean, this is something that's simple and, and easy for somebody who's not looking for something that's you know, fully immersive such as that. So yeah, there's sort of competition, but not really. Sure. So how do you handle, <coughs> excuse me, how do you handle placement? So if you go out and you have 300 guides and you get in there and I'm guide 181 down on the pages, I'm not going to probably be very happy with that. So how do you, how do you handle the placement on your, on your website? Sure. So our developers have invented an algorithm that would move and rotate them throughout the course of the experience. So it's not always going to be, you know, the number one person at the top at always. It's not like Google AdWords. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Um, and there's going to be a multiple set of you know reviews and filters in there that'll end, end up you know placing the right guide with the right clientele. I saw you had a question. Yeah. So as far as, so kind of follow up on that. So as far as we're all so assume we're all guides, do we all pay the same commission? Is it percentage or how does that work on the guide side? Yes. I um I don't know if I'm going to do it. Um, so yes, you'll be paying a 10 percent commission, um, and based on volumes, there may be some discounts on that. What if I want to pay a nine percent commission? Can I do that? No. <laughs> I mean, unless you unless you come up with me and promise me, you know, volume. So customer experience is purely um, uh, based on evaluations, customer evaluations. You're not doing any curation of who's going to be on the site. Have you? No, no, no. Um, so we will have a sales rep um, who will take care of the Alaska territory and any territories that we seem fit for him after that point. Um, so he'll actually go out and actively manage these customers, our customers, not the clients, mm -hmm. the guides, and take care of them. <clears throat> How do you handle the risk of the guide flaking out on you? See, that's the thing. They're going to have a review process. And I mean, if they're not, if they're not able to handle you know, their business, we'll, we'll do a little handholding. But at the end of the day, if they're, if they're making Harbinger look bad, we don't want to do business with them. But that, at that point where it looks bad, I'm up here, I'm going to get on my boat, there's no boat. Who, how do you handle that? That's, uh, I mean, uh, we'll, we'll have a customer service representative who takes care of any refunds. Um, at that point, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a hashtag for the, uh, for the guide at that point. Three strike system. I, did I miss a question over here? No, I was asking that same question about how do you handle the disappointments which are bound to occur at some level. And uh, if I've just put my, uh, if I'm a, the person who's hiring the, the guy through Harbinger and I just put my thousand know, dollars down or whatever it is, I'm um, ready to go for this fishing trip of a lifetime and it's not there. Yeah. How do you how do you handle that? So ultimately, like I said earlier, we control the revenue stream. So the customer pays us, we pay the guide, less our commission. So at that point, it's it's, it's an easy conversation to have with the client. Is here's your money back, and you know the guide will get reprimanded at that point. <coughs> Any more questions? I, I had a question. Sure. Um, so the customer goes online, hits book it, they're booking a trip. How does, what does Carl get in terms of, how does he know he just got a booking and where does it go? Sure. So the client will get uh, a notification via email or text and as will Carl. Okay. So Carl's got to take that and manage it in his own, you know, booking system, whatever that is, spreadsheet or whatever yep. he's got. You don't, you wouldn't host, have you thought about potentially hosting the booking so we, so part of our back end and part of where that hundred thousand dollars for the website app comes is there's a lot of spinning gears in the back that is going to take care of. We will be hosting our own service for them, as far as a calendar and availability and a price. So when you have a situation like that and you have a disappointed person standing on the dock, you might be able to look into your system and say, Captain John over here has got a seat available. He's leaving in thirty minutes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, part of the problem is you know overbooking. We don't want that to happen. So. That's part of the, the, the strike system with the guys is you can't allow that to happen. It's, you know, use this in conjunction with your current system or, you know, a job to ours. But either way, just make it work and make it do right. Just case. one more question. For a typical guiding company, what's their profit margin? How much is this 10% going to hurt that they have to give up? To? Are they going to jump on? So the guys that we've asked, um, some of them have been in the industry for a long time, and some of them have been uh, not in the industry for a long time, and they all jumped in on it. Each of them has different um, you know, profit margins as they're in different industries, um, or different areas. They're close to, but um, they all jumped on it. They, they wanted to be a part of it. I mean, and going back to one of my other previous slides, is I showed you the, the, the clustered pamphlet deck that no one ever looks at. You probably never look at it. I mean, 
um, all the tourists look at and they throw them away. They, essentially, they won't need that anymore. We'll, we'll be marketing for them, so there's a cost trade-off there. So thank you all for your attention. Um, we're looking for a partner. We're looking for capital. Uh, we're looking for the audience's vote. And uh, like us on Facebook. Go to our website. Thank you. Thank you. It's my pleasure to introduce Cousin Runners, Kristen Gilbert and Dora Moore. Oh. <laughs> we haven't done anything yet. <laughs> oh, well, thank you for um, letting us be here today and coming and spending your Sunday with us. We're excited to present. Um, my name is Kristen Gilbert, as she said, and I'm from Brigham City, a small town in northern Utah, and I've spent my adult life living in small towns across the Rocky Mountains. And I think I've moved to the smallest town Ever, which is Alaska, it seems like, um, six years ago. And my name is Dora Christine Moore. I'm originally from Imanic. I'm currently living here in Anchorage. I'm a, a student at Alaska Pacific University, and my major is business administration. And getting right down to business, I have a daughter, and we're preparing for her wedding, and I cannot pick up the wedding cake. I have millions of tasks to do. I also have an uncle in Imanic, Alaska, who needs a snow machine part that he's seen on Craigslist. And he needs an expert opinion on the snow machine part. Or sometimes I'm just in the mood for watermelon and I, that I cannot get in rural Alaska. I asked my sister to do these errands, but, she, but she's too busy, so she recommends Cousin Runners. Cousin Runner, we are the Uber of errand running with one key difference. We, instead of, instead of strangers, we have your friends and family and your friends of friends who run the errands for you. We connect you with them. When we were going through this process, we um, uncovered a great need for this type of service. We posted one Facebook post back in February. We got 25 likes in 24 hours, 44 comments, and to date from that one post, Dara has, Dora has run five errands and completed five orders. Reynaldo kicked in from Kotlik, Alaska. He stated that there are services out there, but they charge too much in the process to pack and send them out. We need to figure out how to consume cheaper prices in rural Alaska. And this really sums up the problem that we have. What's exciting is that the sharing economy is um, hitting all these big cities all over the world. New York City, San Francisco. You can, go to, you can go to New York City and get a ride with an Uber driver. You can go to San Francisco and rent a car from a stranger on Lyft. Or you can go to TaskRabbit and get somebody to stand in line at the post office for you. This whole sector of the economy right last year was valued, including Airbnb, was valued at uh, $15 million, $15 billion, excuse me. And um, in 10 years, they expect there's an incredible amount of growth in this sector to be $325 billion by 2025. So all of these things are happening in these big cities, but we're not really getting the technology of the real sharing economies in Alaska just because we're too small. And so is it better for us to wait around what, until these technologies trickle down to us, or is it better to create our own solutions? And we're not just talking about Alaskans. We're talking about um, faith communities, um, parent groups, um, any of these connected communities that don't necessarily trust a stranger to run their errands for them. And the one key difference is it's not, it's really, trust is built by it's who knows you. And within a couple degrees of se separation, how can you connect um, to the people? You'll only ask the people around you. And it could be a cousin, it could be an aunt, it could be a grandparent, or probably not a grandparent, you're probably running your grandparents' errands. But those are the people that you trust to run your errands. And a cousin runner, what, what we're offering is this platform, which will be a peer-to-peer -peer and a business-to-consumer marketplace where we can connect these runners and cousins on a simple mobile platform that everybody can use from their phone or the internet. We'll also provide a trusted financial network to, to manage these transa transactions because the errands that these communities need to run are a little more complicated than um, you would have a stranger do. 
And then also, uh, we uh, supply a rating system, which helps build the social connections between the network, but it also helps us increase the complexity of the errands um, different runners can run and helps with our runner supply. So what are the benefits that the two-sided marketplace gets out of, uh, out of Cousin Runner? Well, on the cousin side, we kind of talked about some of those with Dora. She wants that watermelon. She needs that expert opinion on a snow machine. Um, they save time and money, like, a, and a lot can be saved, especially with the interesting and complicated problems that um, one of our first markets, uh, rural Alaska, has in getting things done. Runners, on the other hand, you know, they can earn cash. Um, more and more, these things can um, earn cash because the people that need them really value, and it will save them money in the long run. They also can net favors. You know, it's it's all these runners. Or your family and cousins get overwhelmed um, with all the requests they get. So if they have kind of a system to trade those favors back and forth, it might not necessarily be money, but it, they, can, they can trade it back and forth. This, this particular feature might be really good for faith communities who want to connect their con congregations to do service with one another as well. So let's go into the user experience a little bit. So a cousin posts an errand. That comes into our matching engine that looks at social network connections, the number of, of errands that a runner has done, and then their collective rating system. And that matches that, that errand with a connected runner who then accepts the runner. Then within our system, we're actually going to move into this transactional space we like to call the hug. Because we need to add more trust to this system than an, another type of sharing economy system would have because you're not just going to let anybody run your, run your grandma to the doctor's office. You need to have a little bit more trust. And they've actually done a lot of studies of, like with Lyft um, who, if there's no personal interaction between the two, they're more likely to crash your car. So we want to build as much trust in the system as possible. And the other way we'll build trust is that any funds that, that are needed for, cost, for the cost of goods and services or the runner fees, we will hold an escrow until the, the errand is complete or, and help manage um, that transaction as it's going through. Um, so, and while we're doing that, the runner runs the errands. And then also during that time, they might will have a private messaging feature so they can co connect with one another. The errand might just be taking a couple pictures of, uh, to do some product research for somebody. So it, you, the private messaging might be the whole errand system, but that'll be a, a feature as well. And then the last part is when the errand's complete, the cousin, the cousin will deliver, the, deliver and say the, the um, errand is complete and release the funds in escrow and also rate the runner at the same time so you can kind of get that um, loop closed. Our first market for sure is uh, Alaskans. This is where the need was demonstrated, but we also believe that the need um, will serve other mid-sized communities with um, the same, same type of issues. And the, the other kind of big Big companies um, reaching those bigger markets are targeting like the San Francisco's and the New York's, and there's really a lot of demand in these smaller communities um, that need that have the, they have the same constraints and, and time and money, and they're looking for people to do errands for them. We also think we can compete in bigger cities if we can find tight knit communities that would would benefit from the thing. I envision like a a, a neighborhood of moms who wants to help help each other out with grocery shopping or picking up kids at the at, the, at schools. So our revenue streams is actually going to be mainly a subscription model. And um, so, well, and I'll talk a little bit in a minute about why, why somebody would want to subscribe. But anybody can post an errand for free, um, but on our platform they can download the app, um, but that errand has to be for an exchange of funds with the runner. The runner will always receive money for the freemium user. But um, for subscribers, we want to have, um, they'll be, be able to do that favor function, so that's when we can gather in the mom groups, the faith, faith communities, so they can, they can exchange favors with one another. And um, also, they'll be eligible for our, our uh, featured events. So these will be discounted type Groupon events where we'll partner with local businesses who will advertise on the site and we'll coordinate with 
our, our runner base to do, like for example, Super Bowl Sunday party boxes that will deliver around the state of Alaska. And they can get on a, in on these orders at a discounted rate, so it's saving them money, but our business partners can also uh, match up with their customers. We expect a growth, growth in users um, over the next five years from around 15,000 to 16,000. And the uh, curve of subscribers will kind of go along that from 8,400 up to 40,000. And this is probably when we're getting into other communities. The other, the other revenue streams and units um, kind of stay at a flat model until we can kind of determine, you know, we might have to pivot a little bit depending on what the needs of the customers are. But there's the potential for those to also rise a lot. What's exciting about the subscription model is that we can keep a positive cash flow, flow for the first five years of the business and uh, kind of scale as we get more users and subscribers we can scale up and add staff and um, move from there. We really feel like we're a good team uh, to bring this home. Uh, Dora is like our number one runner. She's already fulfilled five orders and has a really good handle on the needs of our target market. And I have been working on these types of platforms with the federal government, and it's been, my, it's been my goal in life to make life easier for people who have to deal with government. So, uh, <laughs> so I have a lot of, I have a lot of user experience um, to add to this. Um, we, we need some help in terms of um, developing the app. Um, and doing a little bit of marketing. I think we have a, another, some good crowdsourcing and user acquisition methods that don't require a lot of money. But um, this would be an offer of 10, this is definitely up for debate, 10% equity in the company. And we're just really excited um, to find something to um, and the te bring the technology to power some of the most established sharing economies in the world. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Any questions? So one of the problems that Uber and Lyft and a lot of the, the, the uh, crowdsourcing apps are having is uh, liability issues in terms mm -hmm. of insurance, securing insurance, things like that. How are you going to address that in this model? Um, I think definitely, so the similar service, TaskRabbit, um, they insure every single one of their tasks up to a million dollars. And so, but as we're starting out, we're kind of going to, we're definitely going to look at building up the trust up front so there's not a lot of liability going into it. And um, when we're first starting, uh, we'll be have a core of really vetted trusted <coughs> runners that are connected to everybody in that social network so we can just minimize risk as much as possible. But we anticipate we'll be using some of those things as and well. So I just a real quick point. You said that people might be transporting other people like you might take my grandmother to a medical appointment. I mean, the liability on that is, is kind of terrifying if you get into an accident. That's something yeah. I would definitely yeah. want to consider that. De definitely, yeah. And I think we'll be considering all the things, like it's a combination of Uber and TaskRabbit because it's providing you know, a mix of errands that are unique to our market. So uh, there's definitely some things, to and insurance will be a big part of that. Is there a federal, state, TSA, what have you, hurdle for moving other people's things throughout the state? Um, what what are, most of our research did in terms of, uh, like, it, it's mainly personal shopping is what the, the thing is in Alaska. And so we'd have to look at making sure that uh, we're not transporting things that can't be transported as in terms of hazardous materials or we're transporting hazardous materials correctly, um, which can be done. Um, but some of these things are as simple. There's already established systems like Walmart does a variety of bush orders. And it's just they need somebody to go into the store and order it for them. And then the, the rest is taken care of. So we'll scale up in terms of the complexity of errands based on you know, these issues you're talking about in terms of insurance, you know, we'll, we'll try to focus until we can grow big enough that we can, we can serve everybody. Can you tell me a little bit more about the escrowing function? How, how does that work? Well, uh, the problem is, is that people don't necessarily want to, like, the, the errands that people want to do are our personal shopping that could be upwards of, you know, three or four hundred dollars. So they don't necessarily want to give that up front. And so our system will build in, it'll either be like a, a, a third party type financial um, management system like Stripe, which it drives Uber, or um, when we get to do more complicated <coughs> errands, uh, maybe issuing some prepaid uh, debit cards. So that, and they're only very trusted vetted runners who've done a multiple complexity of errands can get these, but then they can track 
we can track exactly what they're spending based on what the person wanted the person the the um, runner to do. So if it's a, a bush order, they have to input their receipts via their cell phone as soon as they they go to the store, and you can watch that. So just following up on that, it seems like that's that uh, verification uh, seems labor intensive and time intensive. And if you if you've got to be tracking and checking uh, that's a person right. going over the receipts. How's that going to work? The, the other part of it, too, is that what, what this is going to get us, especially for somewhere like Alaska, we're going to kind of, there's we have this other revenue model in there called bundled services. And so if we see a lot of people requesting types of things, like we as we kind of move away from, and this is kind of one of those pivot points, I don't know how much this is going to be needed, but if like 100 people in one community are ordering like one product, and then we can say, oh, well, Let's just do this in a bundled order, and we can handle the financial transaction um, and all the logistics with it within the company without bringing in a different order. So I think at that point, you if we if we pivot that way and do more of those bundled orders, we'll probably see um, it. We'll just hire employees to do the logistics. So you get an aggregator in that. Thing. Yeah. What about what about restricted uh, materials? Like I mean, certain communities in, in rural Alaska are dry, and we just legalize marijuana. Are you going to limit what your what people can order? Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Our number. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I was going to say, can I just share one order that we recently had? We, for example, we had a, a rural Alaska. They have a lot of fishing, and one fisherman had called me up and said, "Hey, may you please go to Walmart? I had set up a fish finder. I want to purchase a fish finder. It's one hundred and ninety-nine dollars. I, if you go there for forty minutes of your time, I can pay you fifty bucks." And that's you know that's yeah. what I did. That's a, that's an actual order. But to your hazardous materials yeah. um, comment, our and those restricted materials. I mean, our I think we're, the reason that we're in this is because we see this need and we want to fill that social need as well. But we also think there's a lot of potential for profit in this as well. But we don't want to violate those things. So we'll, we'll put every kind of system check we can um, to not allow those things to happen. And more part of our company culture, I guess. So you're looking, you're looking to give up 10% of your business for $100,000, so in your mind, your business was worth a million dollars. How did you get to that um, space? For the, first, for the first five years of development, in terms of our um, compressed financials, well, at, at the end of that, our, our, what we will make on, on, in terms of per transaction, um, uh, sorry. Uh, oh, so so uh, we'll make that we have it's like eighty to seventy percent is what we're making on each um, transaction. So it's uh, the Cogs Direct. And, uh, I don't know my terms. So um, and then over the course of five years, when we grow to forty thousand users, we'll be at um, two million dollars gross gross profit at the end of that. So I think we just put that out as, out as a, a point of negotiation too. We're still kind of looking for that tech founder and some other things that we're, we're um, dealing with, so that's definitely up for negotiation. So Scott and then Terry, and we gotta Sorry. go quick. Sorry. How far along is your software development? Just not quite there. We, we came up with this idea at Startup Weekend back in February and have kind of been rolling forward with it since then. Um, we've met with some, I, I kind of conceptually know what kind of system we want to put together. It has to be incredibly simple and um, do the basic functions. But our minimum viable product will probably actually just start experimenting with a, like a Facebook group, you know, and, and getting some trusted runners to, to do some errands for people and going that way. So I think we're still kind of in the customer discovery phase and we'll hopefully down the line um, go full gear on the app development. We've also had some corporations already want to invest in us right now, but we're not that far yet. So and Terry's going to Sorry, guys. This has been asked and answered, yeah. but I want you to go pick up my dry cleaning. It's going to be about 90 bucks. Walk me through that. Right. So um, we connect you with a runner that's available and can do that in your time frame. And then we hold, you, you charge your, your card that $90, which we hold an escrow um, while that person does it. And this is kind of more further on if, it, if, that, if that's... Expense, that expensive. We'd also take into escrow what we think the projected runner fee would be, which was, um, and that, that'll come down the line too, but might be like 25, 20 bucks an hour, you know. And so all that comes into escrow, 
And then we would issue, uh, there's a, actually a prepaid card called a PEX card that you could issue, the, this is just one way to do it, Is, issue the runner that, and then as they go and they, they go to the dry cleaner, they pay with the PEX card, we're monitoring that transaction, or the system's monitoring that transaction that comes in, and then you, you get your, your dry cleaning delivered, you go into the app and say, okay, oh, hey, you delivered my dry cleaning, I say, oh, I accept that this is complete and um, rate him at the same time and you have your delivery and then the funds are released to the runner. The, the runner fee, because he's already paid for the dry cleaning. Any other quick points? Thank right. you. Thank you. Thank you. We have one last presentation and then I'll let you all get a quick break. I know everyone's been sitting a long time. It's my pleasure to introduce Northern Catch, Teddy Pease and Garrett McKinney. I thought you were stopping me. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. My name is Teddy Pease. This is my co-founder, Garrett McKinney. We are the founders of Northern Catch, an Alaskan seafood subscription service. I'm really excited to talk to you about a problem I have today. We all, being here in Alaska, have access to some of the best seafood in the world right in our back door. And we may take it for granted. We don't appreciate how unique and special that really is. But some of our friends and family that live in the lower 48 or other parts of the country don't have access to this incredible product. Northern Catch has a way to fix this, though. What is Northern Catch? We are a seafood subscription service that for $129 a month will deliver five or more pounds of high quality Alaskan seafood to our customer's door. We'll rotate what we offer as the fishing season changes. You, you know that we have different seasons here in Alaska and different fish that are available that change with those. And we'll be able to customize our boxes based on what is available. For instance, in the summer, we might offer red salmon, king salmon and rockfish, whereas when we sent out a box in February, it could consist of predominantly crab, scallops, and cod. And people get to ex experience the full range of Alaskan seafood. What we're going to send to our customers will be packed in an insulated shipping box and we packed on dry ice to preserve the quality and the freshness of the fish. Protein, fish, meat, things like that, freeze very well. And it is actually a way to preserve the quality of the product. We would only accept fish that comes from processors that buy off of boats that use refrigerated salt water to keep their catch fresh, or that have uh, the fish put on ice immediately after catch and are processed within 24 hours. All the fish will be vacuum packed in individual one pound packages. And this is a convenient size for people. If uh, a couple is having a meal to themselves, they can get out one package and it's the perfect size. If you're having a meal with your entire family, you may want to get out two or three packages and have it be a, a real family experience sharing the bounty Alaska has to offer. My favorite part about what's in our box, though, is this story card. It will be a description of the unique background that we have here in Alaska. If you have shrimp from Prince William Sound, on this story card will be a description of the fishery that these shrimp came from. It will talk to you about the history and some of the exciting things about Prince William Sound. And on the back side of that story card will be a recipe and some of the suggested uh, ways to serve the fish that we have in the box this month. Because we don't feel that someone needs to be a gourmet chef to truly experience and enjoy gourmet seafood. Is this something that can actually happen? Is there a big enough market out there for it? The seafood industry is a $5 billion a year market as of 2012. Quite substantial. What's even more remarkable is the growth we've seen in subscription services, which is the model that our business would be operating under. You may be familiar with Plated or B Blue Apron. They are subscription services that offer monthly boxes. They are full meal kits. They have all the ingredients you need to, to cook a meal, and they send them out on a monthly basis. Each of these companies, within the past year, has gotten a venture capital investment of over $20 million. 
Full Circle is another subscription company that many of you may be familiar with. They're actually pretty popular here in Alaska. And they offer produce that gets uh, delivered to people either weekly, bi-weekly, or monthly. And as of 2011, they had over 5,000 subscribers in Alaska alone, which is incredible considering that Alaska is the second least populous state in the nation. And at the time, they were still growing. The company that's closest to what we're doing is actually a seafood subscription, is Sitka Salmon Shares. And it was really exciting to see them as kind of a, a proof of concept of the type of business we, we were looking to do. But they're keeping it quite small. They only operate in the Great Lakes region. Uh, they were started out just in Chicago. They now have uh, 11 pickup locations throughout the Great Lakes region, but have not expanded beyond that. Are we financially viable? This is using a very conservative estimate, kind of a, what we would describe as our worst case scenario. What if we're only able to get uh, an average of 1,000 subscribers over the first year of operations, which, remember, Full Circle was able to have, after 18 months, 5,000 subscribers in Alaska alone. In this worst case scenario, we would be able to be profitable in year two and cash flow positive in year one, which is remarkable for a startup. What's really exciting for me, though, is the fact that this is a worst case scenario. Because we view a more realistic scenario at 1,500 subscribers averaged over the first year. And with that, things look a whole lot better. We'd almost break even in year one with just about a $100,000 net loss. But the bigger thing is cash flows would be positive by 180000 which is really attractive for us in year two to be able to grow our subscription base. And you might be asking, where do these numbers come from? They might seem absurd. Well, Teddy talked about Blue Apron. That was a company that, again, packaged dinners. Uh, in their 18th month of operation, they were sending out 500,000 meals a month. And up until that point, they were doubling their subscriber base every six weeks. So there's a lot of potential in these subscription models. Uh, so we took into account that seafood is not dinner, it's a little bit different. And in year two, we, uh, we estimated that we could grow 500% from our 1,500 average in year one, in year three, 200%, and year four, 100%. So that's how we projected growth on this. Now it's gonna take some capital to make it happen. And some of our biggest expenses are inventory and shipping, uh, getting that the fish uh, from the processor down to our fulfillment center in Kansas City. We'll be using frozen fulfillment because they are the most efficient, cost-effective way to get products. It's frozen and perishable to your house. The second biggest expense is marketing and promotion. Because this is a, not a physical company in the sense where it's a brick and mortar place, this is all web-based, attracting people to that website is, is going to be a bit of a task. Now, two expenses that are not as big but still very important are the call center and website. Because someone can't come in and see someone, uh, you face to face, they may still want to have a human interaction. So we do want to have a call center that someone can call and talk to uh, about the setting up a subscription or leaving some feedback about how they're enjoying it. Now the fourth thing on this list that's not necessarily a big expense, but one of the most critical is the web development. Having a website is going to be the, the first thing a customer sees of Northern Catch until they receive our product. We want to have a website that people can go to to subscribe and log into their customer account to adjust for allergies they may have to a, a certain type of seafood and taste preferences. Now, the way we're going to gather these subscribers, we have three main avenues. Our biggest one is podcasts. If you're familiar with podcasts, they're generally free shows that are either audio or video, but they're very targeted topics such as technology, cars, or food. We're going after food. Uh, these ads are inserted generally right in the middle of the show, and these people are already predispositioned to, to look for products that are, pertain to that. Uh, another big component is going to be AdWords and web uh, search engine optimization, making it so that when someone searches Alaskan <coughs> seafood, we're one of the first options for them to be able to purchase and get a hold of it. And our third thing on this list is product pairing partnerships. Uh, we've looked into what it would take to maybe pair with a winery where uh, a wine of the month package would go out along with a package of Northern Catch seafood. Now this is going to take some investment, and right now we're looking at a $30,000 seed, which we're already in negotiations to have. And the bigger part, though, is the initial investment, where we're looking for $550,000 to $600,000 to make this happen. Uh, and that, that capital investment would go into about 8 to 10 months of general operating costs, which would cover that inventory, uh, the marketing campaign, getting the website up, and getting it all ready to really launch, because we do plan on launching in all 50 states, because going through a shipping avenue, it's, it's really easy. 50 states versus 10 states, there's really no difference. And 
what we really believe is that Northern Catch will share Alaskan seafood with discerning customers that appreciate the story and quality that Alaska has to offer. Thank you, and now we have some time for questions. Yes. So, uh, do you know much on duration of subscription for something like Full Circle? I know they had a really hard Groupon push, so I don't know. So Full Circle, I'm gonna take this one, is a bit interesting because they do perishable produce. Uh, so they do have quite the fluctuation. Uh, many people often subscribe just for certain months. Mm -hmm. um, they weren't the biggest example we were looking at. We were getting more of Blue Apron, uh, played in HelloFresh, where they do full dinners. Um, and they have a much, much longer range where people don't use it seasonally. They generally subscribe, and as long as they like it, they tend to hold on to it for a year plus. Thank you. Yeah. Have you talked with ASME at all, Alaska Seafood Marketing Institute? Uh, there's someone you're probably going to want to reach out to, I mean, they, especially if, when you're talking about the recipes and things like that. They have a uh, Cook from Frozen program that I think would pair perfectly with this, but they're also, they know exactly how to market seafood, so there might be a good conversation. Yeah, we, we know that they're kind of, the, the game in town for getting the word out for Alaskan seafood, and that's, you know, in part of our planning process, we've, as we move more towards the marketing stage, we, we plan to be in direct contact and work quite closely with them. Yeah, so I think it's interesting because it builds on a strong industrial sector in Alaska already, which is, which is fishing, but um, how about the price, though? I mean, $129 a, a month, you get five pounds of fish, that's, you know, over $25 a pound. Have you done any market testing on this? So, again, we use some of the other subscription models out there, um, looking at like plated or blue apron. Yeah, but don't tell, talk to me about like, that, that's, okay, well, what are they, go ahead, sorry. Uh, they average $10 a meal for a meal you're prepping at your own house. And people weren't necessarily buying it because of what's coming in the box, they're buying it for the convenience. And this is also something we've read a lot of reviews about people who buy full circle. Now, you could go to the Fred Meyer, you can get organic produce, that's not new. It's a, the convenience factor, and you're, you're getting it, in turn, you're forced to eat it. A lot of people really like that idea of subscription services. They get something they need or want, and they have it already to use. If that helps answer your question and, there. And, and more directly to the price point, the, the company that's closest to what we're doing the, that I mentioned was Sitka Salmon Shares, and they are in a similar, and in sometimes a higher price point, and have actually had a, uh, gotten to the point where they have cut off the number of subscriptions in, in the Chicago area because the, the, their model is using uh, shares of catch from specific boats, not going after actual processors to get the fish, but going after only what, what the certain boats they contract with can catch. And they have, at that price point, had to cut off orders. Do you know what they, what, where they've cut it off? And what, how big they, the they, they have between um, $129, uh, and some of them go up to nearly 160 I believe. But how many subscribers do they have? So we being a private company, we don't have those numbers. They do operate eight boats um, out of Sitka, and they have 11 pickup sites. Um, and a boat in Sitka can be somewhere around 50,000 pounds each. And they mainly just focus on salmon. They do a little bit of halibut and black cod, but we don't have exact numbers on that. Okay. But you can buy this, <coughs> you're, you're talking about selling frozen fish. You can buy this in any grocery store for the most part, I think. And have you talked, getting back to John's question, talk to seafood marketing to figure out where Alaska seafood is already being shipped throughout the country. I, I'm just trying to get my head around how you guys are, be different if you're selling like fresh caught, but this is frozen, so right? This is frozen for the sake of preserving quality and making it safe to ship, not frozen for storage. So the frozen salmon that people can walk into Fred Meyer and buy today is fish that's been frozen since last summer. Our fish, we wouldn't offer salmon this time of year because we wouldn't be able to get the quality we want. So it, it is frozen to preserve, to preserve quality, not for long-term storage. Uh, how do you preserve the value of the subscription against market fluctuation? Um, it's not clear to me if you are the, the red buyer of the seafood or you are dealing with middle people. 129 versus the price of uh, seafood coming up and down. So the, the price point we have, um, it has a, a cost of goods margin that's wide enough that we can have the cost fluctuate a little bit each month uh, depending on what we offer in the box. And since we aren't, we aren't locking in at you're gonna get exactly five pounds, 
we say you're going to get five or more pounds of seafood. So if we're offering a product at a lower price point because that's what's fresh and that's what good quality that month, we would be able to put more of it in the box that month and keep it to a, a relatively consistent value over the course of the year, regardless of what seafood markets do. And let me check back in with the judges. You have about a minute left. Is there I have a question. As I read through your business plan, um, I was wondering who the suppliers would be of this seafood that would be willing to package it in one pound packages for you and provide it at that in that small a package. Um, and have you done that kind of work to find out who they are? Most of the major processors in the state have one pound packages as one of their off the shelf available products. It's not something we would have to custom order. If you go to the products they offer, that's one of the standard ones. Questions from the judges? Yeah, I have time for like one more question. Um, well, uh, unlike um, Blue Apron, this resource is fully allocated. So how do you imagine scaling? I can see you, you kind of noticed the issue with uh, the sick this year. The reason they can't sell anymore is because they have no more allocation. So when you start to scale, how do you, how do you address that issue? We very well may end up in the same boat as Blue Apron, or not Blue Apron, excuse me, sick of salmon chairs, where we would have to cut off subscriptions. Uh, making sure that we can get enough seafood is, is one of our logistical problems and hurdles to overcome. Uh, that is something we foresee that could be an issue, but directly, um, as long as we source with a big enough processor, that shouldn't be an issue. One of the interesting things about sick of salmon chairs is that they want to trace the story back to the boat who caught it. That's not necessarily our goal. We do want to always source this from a sustainable fleet of boats, but we're not going to go so micro where you're struggling to be able to get enough fish. transition on you now. Dear judges, you have a room, it's a Widener real estate room. If you go out this door and straight back, there's water for you. I'm sorry that you've been sitting there parched. <laughs> you have 30 minutes max, but I'm told you can do this in 15 minutes. <laughs> All right, and then the rest of you in the audience, please stay put because we're going to do a couple quick things here and then you will be able to take a break so if you need to step out and stretch that's fine but we're going to um, of course neighbors has a couple uh, notes we have a presentation and we have the people's vote all to take care of here quickly and so and by then the judges will be back and then we can all go out and have refreshments and talk to the awardees and all the rest of our business plan competition can i turn it over to you Good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> if you are a student of Professor Al Herman, I believe you have some things for me. <laughs> I am his proctor, I'm his substitute teacher today. So uh, I'm Professor Forrest Neighbors here at UAA. And a fight's broken out, and I barely even said anything. Okay. Uh, but uh, just if you could get me those envelopes now or uh, before the end of the presentation, I'd appreciate it. Okay. <laughs> this uh, business plan competition has become one of the highlights of my year. And uh, it's, it's a pleasure to come, to come every year and see new business plans presented. I'm also a, uh, along with Kai Holland and, and Professor uh, and Al Herman, um, and uh, I can just, I'll just take him here, that's fine. Thank you, Christy. We are partners in Alyeska Venture Management, which manages the, um, Alaska Accelerator Fund, and um, it's wonderful to see our entrepreneurial ecosystem growing. Uh, one new wrinkle that Al and I are, have been talking about and are working at, on here for the university is to develop out our entrepreneurship curriculum, and uh, which is important, I think, for the university, for the state, 
Everybody knows that the price of oil is dropping. I loved what Zoe said a few moments ago in answer to the question about why Alaska. And she said, well, we've been dependent upon any energy production so long. We've, it's about time that we have new companies from different industrial sectors that are vibrant, growing, and diversifying the Alaska economy. And uh, that's something that uh, my partners and I in the fund um, firmly believe in, and it's the purpose, you know, why we want to uh, really strengthen the entrepreneurial curriculum here at UAA and uh, see uh, students from other majors minor in entrepreneurship and so on so that we can diversify and build um, strong talent um, here in the state that, who are, uh, uh, that's uh, going to lead to new, new companies and new industrial sectors. So and this business plan competition is really uh, one of the crowning uh, moments, I think, in, in our year that marks our development, the development of, of entrepreneurship here in Alaska. So um, I counted maybe three or four people I want to introduce to other people. I hope you stay for the networking. Um, after the competition is finished and, and fellowship. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Jason Smith, who is founder and CEO of Alaska Natural Organics. And I'm going to say a few things that are going to make Jason blush here in just a second. Um, Jason and I started working together two years ago. He was third place. Third place in the second business plan. Place. Second, second place, place. sorry. Thank you. In, the, in the business plan competition. And this might sound shocking, uh, but um, I wasn't terribly impressed with the business plan. It was it was good. It yeah, was solid. By the hundredth presentation. But I wasn't I was impressed by this guy. And uh, so and that convinced me to start working with Jason. Um, uh, his company, Alaska Natural Organics, now is poised for incredible growth. You've probably read about it in the ADN recently. Uh, and, um, you know, we, I am now a huge believer in his business model. I think it's, it is uh, going to revolutionize the food supply in the state of Alaska and really could become a significant contributor to um, new f food security um, uh, enterprises in the country and possibly in the world. So he's, the, the road ahead of him is clear to do great things. And, uh, you know, Jason's going to be a entrepreneurial superstar in this state. I'm convinced of that. And uh, we, need, we need more. So we're happy to work with new entrepreneurial talent, and, um, and that's why we love to come out at the business, uh, business plan competition, which is where I really began to get to know Jason. So Jason, thank you very much for your work, uh, which is going to benefit the state and employees and shareholders and everything. It's, it's a real pleasure to introduce you. Thanks, Forrest. Yeah. Thanks, guys. I was asked to come here and just sort of share my story, my experiences, and uh, you know, like Forrest said, I was uh, I competed in the business plan competition in 2013. I took second place, and a lot has happened from that time till now. Uh, during the competition, right after the competition, I was asked uh, why compete. What's the value of competing in a business plan competition? Well, then I said, well, because then I can go to investors and I have an award-winning business plan. And they're like, well, you know, that's a good point. <laughs> And actually, that was enough to get in the door. It's at least enough to start a conversation. Um, the business that I started, the Alaska Natural Organics, it's an environmentally controlled indoor hydroponic growing facility where we're going to be growing fresh produce 365 days a year. Very little uh, minimal impact on the environment. Uh, more importantly, it makes it so all that poor quality produce that we've seen in December, we don't have to buy that anymore. Hopefully, we'll be able to fill that niche. Uh, in this whole process, though, I, you know, I, after the business plan competition, that really was just a starting point. I, I, that's when I really had to start working. I've done, oh shoot, at least 50 pitches after that, uh, and every single time, I'm pretty excited to share the story and to really share what's going on and build that excitement. And 
uh, every time I got something out of it, somebody would ask a question that maybe I wasn't prepared for. What about this or what about that? And how do you tackle this or how do you tackle that? And just to make sure that uh, I had every little nook and cranny of the situation figured out. Once I got to that point, once I felt confident that the business would succeed, and it wasn't a hopeful thing. I wasn't just hoping or wishing upon a star that I could pull it off. I wanted to make sure that I wasn't going to commit several years of my life to a failed endeavor either. And so working through the process, I mean, as you guys know, writing your own business plans, it's a lot of work. Um, but don't think you're done just because you finished the business plan. There's going to be multiple more iterations. Uh, you're going to find other things that might come up, things that need to be streamlined. And when you get there, you have it all polished up. It, gives, it goes to the crucible of other investors and other pitches. It's going to feel a whole lot better and a lot, a lot more like a finished product. Uh, I would like to emphasize also the value of the networking. Uh, every single time I had an opportunity to meet someone, and I, I made so many friends along the way. And they're all valuable friends in the sense that uh, I think in the future, as things come up, I'm going to be very happy and willing and able to help them out on any favor they ask. And likewise, they're going to do the same for me. And I really think that collaborative mentality is what's going to develop small business into big business in Alaska. We've got so much coming in from the lower 48. But if we all sort of work together, I mean, we, you don't have to start partnerships with everyone. But just friendships. You know, I've made so many friends in the uh, MBA program as well. And as we all grow and develop professionally, I know whenever they give me a phone call, I'm going to be happy to help them out. And I feel like they'll do the same for me. And so I really just want to emphasize that. Now's the time to start developing those networking skills and making those friendships. And like Dr. Neighbor said, hey, after this event, there's going to be a chance to do just that. I would encourage you not to just say, you know, like check in the box, I went to this event and leave. Make friends, get to know people, because for all you know, in five, ten years, there are going to be some successful people, and you might be as well. And it'd be great to be able to help and build on each other and support each other as you grow. And that's all I got, guys. Thanks for your time. All right. Well, thank you for staying to the very end here. Uh, we are going to go ahead and start making some special announcements. But before we do that, I want to take a moment to make certain that I thank North Rim Bank and First National Bank. Each of these banks have been sponsors since the very beginning in 1999, and we would not be able to do this without you. So thank you very much. Again, I want to also acknowledge TEAM, the Entrepreneur and Mentors Network, as well as all of the University of Alaska System and Alaska Pacific University who collaborate to make this happen in our Center for Economic Development with the University of Alaska, who's also been engaged. So, you ready to have the, the big news here? All right, I'm going to start with our judges' decisions. So in third place, we have, and I'm going to mess up the name again, Alaska Paracord. It's Paracord, isn't it? Yeah, it's just written here wrong. Thousand dollars in winnings for their startup. 
you are uh, putting the cards in the boxes, uh, the telling the story of Alaska, and particularly the fisheries. I know, so my mom, who I've been in Alaska for over 20 years, she still gets Alaska Magazine. She loves stuff like that, and I know she would subscribe to it in a heartbeat, and uh, probably just to get the card, right? I mean, that's <laughs> <much>. <laughs> I think that uh, some people mentioned some issues with trying to get enough fish for the boxes. I think if you market this to them more as a, a marketing of the Alaska seafood industry as a whole, as opposed to a direct sales route, I think they'll probably be more open to that. So that might be an avenue to pursue if you do get uh, pushback. All right, you ready? All right, drum roll. also voting and I would like to now acknowledge our People's Choice Award. In first place by those that were participating in the audience, Alaska Paracord Design. <laughs> First National Bank for just being awesome participators both from a judges level and helping sponsor this event. Uh, I also want to thank all of you for spending your Sunday afternoon with us and then I'd love to encourage all of you to continue to help support our entrepreneurial ecosystem here in Alaska. The next big event that's coming on is uh, Entrepreneurship Week and that is because I lost my notes in
our chief encouragement officer, Alan Johnson. One thing that's evolving with the business plan competition right now, too, is a statewide angel network. And what, the biggest thing in the angel network isn't so much the money from investors as it is mentorship. And four of the judges this year are actually part of the statewide angel network. We're trying to build that up. So if you see one of those folks out there, you're doing a business and somebody has a skill set, you figure out where you want to go and how you're going to get there, see if you can get somebody for free to mentor you. And if there's a mutual match there, then there's a good chance they might want to be putting money into what you're doing. And the mentoring network is the biggest thing we're missing in Alaska right now. We have potential mentors, but they're not sure. <coughs> they don't realize they can con contribute in that time. And anything you can do to help support that, we'd love to see if we can't get that to pick up more. So thank you to our judges. Thank you to all of you for spending your Sunday. Please feel free to network some and um, tap all the expertise in the room. We've got our faculty, Force Neighbors, Kai Holland. <coughs> Well, Alan's not on faculty. He serves often to mentor all of his faculty. So um, Alan Johnston's here. Dean Prasad's in the back. Make certain you connect with all of these folks and um, tap their expertise. Thank you again.